Hi, everybody. We're excited today to talk about Cloudburst and communities and, um, and, and how that works both in, in New York City and, and some other um, areas that we'll get into as well. But I guess first I should introduce myself. I'm Karen Apple. I'm with AECOM, and I lead our climate change work in um, Metro New York. Um, I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves, but I ask them each to um, also tell, tell, us, uh, tell you why we're excited about this panel. Um, I'm excited about this panel because it's, it's an interesting topic. It's, um, you know, stormwater management is something that we've been doing for a long time, but this is a, a kind of a new approach to how we're looking at stormwater management, um, looking at, you know, more extreme uh, uh, rainfall events. And also, just because it's a panel of fabulous professional women following uh, Lori and Farrell, so, um, you know, just keeping that climate change, you know, let's go women um, theme going. <laughs> go ahead, Melissa. Thank you. Um, Melissa Enoch, I am the Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. That's the water utility for the city of New York, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm excited about this panel for the same reason. We're all women, and I think that's very um, amazing. And I'm also just really proud to be in this space right now. Um, as Karen said, it's a very timely topic. Most of us have been involved in stormwater over the years, and we're evolving, and we have really excited work happening, and I'm, I'm happy to share it and to talk about some of the innovative solutions that we've identified here. Uh, to help New Yorkers uh, who are experiencing way more flooding than they used to. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Trine Bunk. You don't have to pronounce it, it's uh, Danish. Uh, you can call me Trina. Uh, I'm a head of sustainability and regeneration at Rambo, which is a global consultancy company based out of Denmark, Copenhagen. Uh, and I've been working in this field for a little over 10 years now, first in Copenhagen, but later also with DEP and others uh, in New York City. And I'm super excited to explore this favorite topic of mine with all of you. And I hope you will be uh, curious and explorative and challenge us on some super exciting questions later. Great. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Erin Mori. I'm the Director of Climate Resilience Planning uh, at the MTA within Construction and Development. I'm very happy to be here today. And I'm excited um, about this panel because I love the momentum that Cloudburst planning has, um, particularly here in New York City. I think it's evident the fact that somebody from the MTA is on this panel that Cloudburst is really expanding across all sectors and uh, across all groups. So thank you, happy to be here. Hey, David, can I get a timer? The timer's not on, thank you. I'll subtract five minutes in my head. <laughs> um, so for, for those of you that um, uh, need um, continuing education credits, this is an approved PDH, uh, I forget, I, AIA, ASLA, <laughs> all those, you know. Uh, so I have to, I'm gonna ask some initial questions and at the end we'll have a little quiz so that we can all get the PDH credits. So um, the first ones are just a uh, show of hands. You don't need to answer one way or the other. So um, who in this room knows what a cloudburst is? Awesome. Okay, well, okay. nice, nice. <laughs> it's all the experts here. We'll, we'll, tell, we'll tell you a little bit more about what we think it is, but that's... Um, so who is aware that New York City, I know, I know the answer to this now. Who is aware <laughs> that New York City uh, DEP has a cloudburst program that is currently being implemented? Okay, look at that. Now who is aware that the MTA just released a climate resilience roadmap? Ah, see, so you know, Aaron's point about MTA being in this, in this uh, climate change, um, extreme weather, uh, um, what venue yeah. is, uh, is, 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 is news to some folks, but we'll, uh, we'll fix that today. So um, even though you all seem to know what Cloudburst means, we'll ask Trina to um, start with an overview of what, what it means and what the definition is. And um, where did the name come from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is fun. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, most of you will know that when we say Cloudburst, we often refer to this short, intense rain that can cause damages to communities, livelihoods, infrastructure. Um, back in 2011, there was a major cloudburst in Copenhagen that then sparked the whole work with this uh, concept. 
Uh, it's called Skuprul in Danish, and at some point, other cities around the world were getting really curious about what Copenhagen was doing. We were like, how do we, how do we translate this work? And someone looked up in a dictionary and found Cloudburst, and then we started using that term in English. I mean, I'm not native English speaker, so you'll have to let me know if, if it even makes sense, but I feel like now it's picked up. Uh, and I think, uh, generally speaking, sometimes maybe it's uh, more understood as a reflection of a new infrastructure type, but actually it refers a lot more to a paradigm shift in urban planning, so thinking differently about how we design our cities. In Copenhagen, they started with citywide, citywide hydraulic modeling, both of inland flood, coastal, connecting it all overland, all these things, looking at climate risk from a different perspective, not only infrastructure, but also loss of livelihoods. They actually, with the cloud, Cloudburst master plan that came out, they could renegotiate insurance premiums for the city. Uh, they changed national legislation to do different urban planning. Uh, so today you can say that it's really water-driven urban design. Every time you have an infrastructure project in the city, you have to look to the Cloudburst master plan to see how you um, let water drive that design, you can say. And then it was also this notion about not only controlling water, but also, I think Lauren really mentioned it, with standards. It was actually also, um, you can say, a rebellious attempt to change the way we think about how we do urban um, development and redevelopment. So basically going back and say, this is place-based design, this is community-led design, so there's no standards in Copenhagen for cloudburst infrastructure. Uh, there's only guidelines. So every time you new, do a new project, it's community-led and it's inspired by that uniqueness of place. Also to make sure that we do actually focus on equity in this work. And I think often when we talk about cloudburst, we tend to think about, oh, it's a new infrastructure or it's that intense rain. It's actually not, it's a flexible design approach where we do work across service levels and protection levels uh, to have a much more resilient and equitable community. So, uh, Melissa, um, can you tell us about how DEP got involved with, with Copenhagen and um, their Cloudburst management program? Sure. Um, well, after Superstorm Sandy in, in 2012, uh, we knew at DEP that we had to start thinking more creatively and look for um, innovative solutions that would help us deal with dual risks and multi-hazards. And we started looking to international um, peer cities uh, for support. And Copenhagen had launched their Cloudburst um, management program and, and was working on their citywide plan. And we started engaging with them. And, and you know, many of you um, might be familiar with our New York City Green Infrastructure Program. And we'd already been thinking about how to um, implement nature-based solutions as an alternative to uh, gray infrastructure, or at least in support of gray infrastructure for wa water quality. And so when we started looking um, to some of the work that Copenhagen was doing, we thought there's, there's more to this than just water quality. We can use some of these types of solutions um, coupled with some of our really important gray infrastructure and um, give us a better bang for buck for stormwater management. And so that's how our partnership and our sister city um, partnership worked. And we really found it to be a safe space, um, working with other planners and engineers in Copenhagen who'd been battling this and really kind of boots on the ground with the public and what works and what doesn't work. And New York is special, right? We have um, you know, a, a long standing history of providing uh, infrastructure and solutions to residents and um, this idea of changing the narrative a little bit, like everybody has a part to play was something we were really, really interested in. Um, so we went, you know, full force into developing our own Cloudburst feasibility study, um, identifying a few pilot areas where we thought some of this alternative infrastructure might work um, to alleviate some of the flooding, and that's, that's where we were 10 years ago, and here now we are into implementation. So wow. it's been a journey. Um, so, Erin, one of the things that we talked about um, when we prepped for this panel was, you know, why is MTA on a Cloudburst panel, <laughs> um, which we were, we were excited about. So the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, how does this relate to the work that you're doing with MTA and the work that MTA is doing? Yeah, yeah, great question. I'm excited to dive into this. So 
Cloudbursts are impactful to our infrastructure across the board, so our subway system, buses, our regional railroads, our bridges and tunnels. So it's something that's definitely on our radar, something we are uh, really focused on. And I wanna um, kind of start with the subway system because it is uniquely vulnerable. 63% is underground, so that does make it more vulnerable um, than our other infrastructure. Um, I don't want to get too into the weeds about the drainage system that exists with the subway system. I, I, it's really interesting, um, at least to me. But the subway system is, is well prepared for groundwater and for everyday uh, rain events that we have. There are pump rooms and there are deep wells and drains and all kinds of infrastructure that moves stormwater and groundwater out of our system um, to DEP system, actually the city sewer system for, for discharge. And a little bit of homework, the next time you take the subway, if you look down in the tracks, you will see some drains and some drain covers. Perhaps you didn't notice those before, but they are there. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure. And you know, at its inception in 1904, um, the subway was built to handle water. It was, it was built to be permeable. But when we're talking about cloud bursts, that's a different story. And um, you know, what we're finding is, is that there are these, these tracks of uh, these pathways of water that are impactful, particularly to the subway system. So there's two that I want to talk a little bit about. The first one is, um, you know, maybe you've thought about this, but the street stairs, so the, um, the entrance and exits to our system. And then the second are the, uh, the vents that you see on the sidewalk throughout the city. So both of these are important to the system, right? You have to be able to enter and leave the subway system, and the vents also help for fire suppression and ventilation within. Um, the system, but they also obviously pose a threat during cloudburst events when there is excessive stormwater flooding on the street, it overtops curbs, it flows on the sidewalk, down, our, down the stairs, down through the vents, and it causes um, issues for us. And I do want to just um, make the distinction that, um, you know, I'm sure you've seen those social media videos with the cascades of water coming through the vents and down the stairs. Um, I'm sure it's impacted your commutes, it's impacted my commutes as well, but I do want to make the distinction that there are those impacts that can have, um, you know, impacts um, that don't interrupt your commute, but then what the issue is is when the stormwater rises above the third rail um, within the track. And this causes an electrical problem where we have to turn off power and that's when we have to stop the train. So what we are solving for is that impact to, to service. We want to reduce the impact to service and reduce the amount of stormwater that is entering through the vents and down the stairs. And I think I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on about the toolbox that we have to, uh, to, to guard against that. Thanks, Erin. So back to Melissa, so um, last January, the city committed $390 million uh, to expand the Cloudburst Management Program from those pilot sites to four new sites. Corona, Casino Park, that's mine, sorry. <laughs> uh, Park Chester and East New York. So can you start by talking about the pilot and then maybe what you envision um, for the, the four new sites that are under design at, as we speak? Sure, so um, back in 2017, when we, we made our first commitment to uh, designing Cloudburst infrastructure, we partnered um, with uh, the New York City Housing Authority, and I know that there are some of our partners here from there today, um, to look at whether or not one of their um, properties would make sense to pilot the infrastructure on. And so we've been working with NYCHA since the start of our green infrastructure program to improve stormwater management on NYCHA properties and also provide CSO reduction um, for our receiving water bodies. So NYCHA was a good fit because there's improvements that can be made on the property grounds through these other types of capital uh, projects. And also in some of the areas that we've identified, um, you can find NYCHA uh, developments surrounded by street flooding. So we thought, why not take this more innovative solution to our partners and see if we can come up with a plan. So we identified a project um, at South Jamaica Houses in southeastern Queens, which is an area of the city that does experience um, repeated flooding uh, due to a lack of stormwater infrastructure and increased precipitation. And we designed a project um, that is going to use a series of conveyance and 
um, safe, floodable storage. So we have a, a sunken basketball court there that will flood in a 10-year event safely, um, and it will recede um, after the event has calmed and the sewer system is able to receive that flow. Um, there's natural, you know, we're using some already natural pathways that water was finding its way anyway um, through the, the development to improve the site. And we're also bringing some amenities uh, to the NYCHA residents as well by partnering with the city council. And so this project um, had a very lengthy community engagement process where we worked with NYCHA residents and also the surrounding community to say, what do you want here? What would make this site um, better for you, more safe during flooding events, and how can we incorporate your vision into this broader vision of improving stormwater and helping the local community who is experiencing flooding? So it's a really great design process, and I'm happy to say we're in construction right now. We expect to be complete next year. It's our first pilot. Um, we're very excited about that. And as Karen mentioned, um, after uh, Hurricane Ida, the city committed almost $400 million to expand this concept across the city to other vulnerable neighborhoods. So these pilots are amazing. We, we feel that this is really this paradigm shift that we're all here talking about today. And it's our opportunity to think bigger about stormwater management. Yes, we're designing these to help us meet our water quality goals, but we're going one step above that. We're looking at a future forward-looking 10-year storm, and we're saying how can we use a combination of surface storage and subsurface storage and conveyance to reduce flooding for these communities. And so each Cloudburst hub, we have five of them that are in design now, four in design now, and a fifth about to enter design. Each of these is gonna use a combination of street space and um, public lands off the streetscape um, to really reimagine the stormwater drainage um, for these, these hubs that we're calling them. So we're really excited to see this you know, program grow from a pilot um, to larger communities that are gonna, gonna get to experience um, this new way of thinking of stormwater management and, and eventually reduce their flooding. Some of these are also being coupled with larger sewer improvement projects, which we're really excited about. Today, the city is releasing a stormwater management plan um, that is identifying the areas of the city that are flooding chronically, and you'll see some of these tools that I'm talking about now outlined in that plan, along with many other tools that we're bringing to some of these areas. And, and again, I think what's you know kind of very consistent across all of these speakers is that this was a new way of thinking, and now it's becoming the norm, and we yeah. are bringing transformative projects um, to New Yorkers, and we're really excited about that. So, Aaron, let's just continue in New York, and then we'll get to Trina again. Um, so, can you just tell us more about the, the Climate um, Resilience Roadmap and what the MTA is doing to address uh, these types of storms? Sure. Yeah, little shameless plug. This yeah. Is yeah. Plan, <laughs> um, available at mta.info slash climate, so please check it out. We just released this um, last month, and really it's a comprehensive framework that um, outlines the capital investments that we need for the next 10 years to, to make our system more resilient. And I think, you know, one of my favorite lines, um, or sentences in this plan, rather, is that um, our customers deserve to know what the MTA is doing to keep our system resilient, and this is an important step in that journey. So. Really happy to be part of this and um, to have released this. Um, I, you know, I could go on about this plan, but there are three things that I want to highlight. Um, first of all, we completed a climate vulnerability assessment. This is a system-wide multi-hazard assessment looking at all of our fixed assets and exposure to multiple climate hazards over time. So that was really the backbone of this plan and informed the capital investments that we'll need now and into the future. So that's number one. Uh, number two uh, is that we have 10 um, climate resilience goals in here um, that focus on flooding and extreme heat and other hazards. And again, that was informed by the climate vulnerability assessment, but these are actionable goals that our small but mighty team is working uh, to, to implement. And then three, we have a really robust implementation framework um, for this roadmap. And it includes, as I mentioned, capital investments 
and not just standalone resilience projects, but also state of good repair projects across the MTA where we can integrate resilience into those projects. Um, also design standards, so making sure that the um, projects that we're designing today are ready for the future. The third is working with our operating agencies to ensure that operation and maintenance continues and um, uh, you know, especially ahead of major storms that it increases like drain cleaning for example. And then fourth is uh, partner action. So working with DEP and DOT and Con Ed, our infrastructure is so very much linked that it, it's really a necessity for, um, for us to coordinate. So um, that's a little bit about our roadmap, but definitely encourage you to, to check it out and let us know what you think. I liked the shameless plug. <laughs> Um, so Trina, you already mentioned this um, when you first started talking about Cloudburst, but um, the community part of this and, and just looking at this in a completely different way in it's not just about stormwater and water quality, it's about making sure the community is involved and there's placemaking um, and, and public amenities. So can you, can you speak to what it, what it takes to co-create these types of projects and um, and, and integrate all of that into a single project and the benefits of doing that for these communities and, and for the people that are designing them too. Big questions. <clears throat> I'll, I'll do my best. Mm. Uh, so the first pilot or the first project, Flowers project, we, we implemented that in uh, 2015 and that was a public-private partnership. So not only communities but actually also uh, other um, companies around the area all co-financed uh, this first project and later uh, multiple projects, each with their own sort of partnership around it. Uh, each of them with a huge community uh, um, engagement, some even before procurement. So uh, even the municipality for some of them let the community decide what should even be procured. Uh, and later actually for one of the same projects that we're still working on during um, public uh, budget negotiations, you can say they scraped up the whole vision that the community kind of co-created and turned it into a more regular conservative grayish infrastructure project. And it was actually the community um, that advocated so hard for this vision that brought it back into City Hall and got it all funded. Um, so you can say the strongest advocates for some of these projects, almost for all of them, are community members. Um, and part of this co-creation is a huge investment into an already really strong resource in these communities. So it's capacity building for them to even understand when we talk about risk, you know, what is the difference between storm surge and mm -hmm. inland flooding? It all sounds like the same water. Yes, it is, but not really. And, you know, taking them through this process of understanding that, um, there's been a focus on local um, construction employment. So making sure that also community members are part of the workforce that will implement them. For some of them, they're educated to um, maintain the non-hydraulic functions of Cloudburst projects, so making community members the owners of these new infrastructure assets. Um, so you can say schools, churches, everyone has been involved in this. Uh, and I would argue that there is no Cloudburst project if there is no community involvement. So it's not just another sort of top-down infrastructure we, we roll out. And this has been fundamental to the way that the city is now doing urban redevelopment. And I will say lately, there's also been a push in more terms of, you can say, if any of you are into regenerative design, uh, to ask critical questions about, when you say community, do you mean living systems? Do you mean people living right now? Or do you mean ancestors, the unborn? You know, what about the bee and the flower? And you know, what about all the actants as freedom or whatever? So there's this whole conversation now about, okay, is it, uh, human focused only uh, or are you actually thinking more broadly about planetary uh, justice uh, and we're I don't have the answer to that I'll just say that uh, that's one of the aspects that now sort of the next generation of cloudburst here into the next decade is actually starting to um, dive into so what's the definition of uh, was it upscaling you upskilling? Yeah. I don't know if that's a Danish term, but... Uh, no, I liked it. <laughs> so that was the definition of, of, of getting the community members to operate the non 
Hy hydraulic. Hydraulic measures. <laughs> yes, so okay. like watering the plants and you know, taking care of some of the, especially with these projects in Copenhagen, there's a lot of real nature. As most of you will know, that takes a lot more maintenance. So obviously that's been very long, lengthy discussions. Maintenance is always an issue when you, know, you venture into these more multidisciplinary co-financed solution, who is gonna pay for the new maintenance and maintenance is high when you want real nature instead of gray infrastructure. Uh, so one of the benefits of this has been that actually that has been also co-financed by local community members who will then own and maintain it to reduce those costs, but then obviously educating them to do so, yeah. So kind of uh, some solutions are similar to what Lorian was talking about. Exactly. Um, in yeah in uh, making sure the community is involved and we're trusting the community to, to uh, give us the, the uh, way to go. Um, so one of the things you said um, um, the beginning of your answer about um, explaining you know, what the difference is between a cloudburst event or a storm water or, so um, we're facing that right now in some of the work that we're doing on cloudburst and just, uh, educating and DEP has done some of it already, but then as we're getting into the communities and you know really getting face to face and one on one with some of the um, community members, just educating on what we're doing, what the differences of what our project may, the, the Cloudburst project may work on versus what another DEP project may work on. So um, just that community engagement being education um, is is part of what I think Cloudburst is about as well. So. Um, Melissa, do you want to share any experience or quick antidote about, or an, I always say antidote. How, what is it? An anecdote. Anecdote. <laughs> Let's do that. It's, okay. it's not a medicine. Well, it kind of is. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think um, we've been doing these flooding town halls um, that are led by our uh, public affairs office, and they've been amazing. They, for the first time, I think we're having these really open, honest, very um, visually uh, represented presentations on what flooding communities are experiencing is and where it's coming from. And I think that's given the communities more um, knowledge and, and tools and, and power really to ask us really good questions. And so I, I like that that's been happening and that these conversations are getting more detailed. And I think, you know, going back to our pilot at South Jamaica Houses, getting, getting direct input from the residents who would be using the basketball court, walking by the rain gardens, using the paths we were creating, you know, actually, you know, welcoming some flood water into their property, which is, you know, a hard concept. But getting that feedback from that community has been extremely valuable. It really did shape the design. There were things they said, you know, we, we don't want to see this project without new lighting, without new equipment. We want um, a more vibrant space. We're willing to rethink the way this property is being used, but we want something from that too. And I think that was um, really powerful for many of us who are, you know, sitting at our desks all day thinking about how to manage more stormwater you know, it brought back the community and that was really important for us. Erin, you've been educating this, this, uh, this, this group already. Do you wanna educate us more on education? Yeah, I'll <laughs> I, sure, of course. I'll, I'll, take, I'll talk a little bit about the toolbox that we have for um, Cloudburst. So, and, and you know, some of the conversations that we have with our customers. So, and I think I alluded to this previously, but we have these openings to the subway system. It is an open system. We have, um, you know, it has to be accessible and there has to be airflow, but it's those same openings that make it vulnerable. And so we do have um, an important toolbox. It is gray infrastructure. It's passive gray um, mitigations that we can use to help to keep stormwater out, particularly during cloudburst events. And they're simple. They're not as attractive as um, green infrastructure, <laughs> I will say. Um, but you've probably seen them, but it's, a, it's like a top step um, where you actually have to go up one step before you go down the stairs to enter the mm -hmm. station. Um, it's amazing what the steps do, particularly in areas where the curb height is low or where there's um, areas of uh, 
drainage issues and it keeps the storm water from cascading down the stairs. Similarly with street vents, we have vent furniture where we increase the height of the vents on the sidewalk. So same thing, so that less storm water is getting in. So that is one thing that we try to get across. We do have a toolbox for, um, for cloud burst management at the MTA and we continue to think about it and to work with our partners too, particularly in areas of the city where additional drainage is needed. It helps DEP, it helps us as well. You forget that I mean, the stairs are obvious, but the vents, unless you're like walking down or doing a Marilyn Monroe moment, you forget <laughs> that the water can yeah. go the same way, right? Yeah. Um, so Trina, do you have any other educational <laughs> stories you wanna share? Uh, I have many. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, we've been working with everything from kids to the US Army Corps. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of uh, fascinating, uh, you, you see these people go through a transformation. I remember actually with the US Army Corps in, in DC, we looked at a watershed wide approach and they were kind of interested in this cloudburst approach and they're like, ah, can, we, can you take us through a workshop? And, and we did and one of the groups were like, ah, it's flooding over here and a small stream, but overflows when it rains, right? And they were like, yeah, we need a wall over here. And then they were like, ah, but then it's gonna flood on the other <laughs> side. And they were like, ah, oh, but then we build a wall over here. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then, you know, two hours later, the same group had to present what they'd been working on in this workshop. And they're like, yeah, we're gonna do decentralized stormwater management. We're gonna activate the communities. We'll do priority number one is like greening throughout, and then it's gonna overflow and it rains a little bit more into these multi-purpose areas. <laughs> And it was just super fascinating to see how quickly you can actually just spark different thinking. And then I will say the other thing we're struggling with, and I'm sure it's the same here, is youth co-creation. I mean, I don't, I, I have teenagers at home, but you know, I don't do Snapchat and all that, but they won't come to regular engagement activities, but they are the future generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are super keen to get them activated in, in this uh, and, and recognizing that the toolbox we have for, for co-creation is not fit for them. Um, so right now, actually, it, we're entering into a partnership with a youth organization in Denmark to, who owns an island. Uh, and they're going to do some events on that island to understand how can we engage with um, youth uh, in this space and also recognizing that water might actually be the solution to many other societal challenges, loneliness, stress, anxiety. Uh, how can we also create solutions uh, that address that, which is something that's, especially in Europe and also over here I know, is something that uh, that generation, uh, if you can talk about generations, is really struggling with. Uh, so again, I also do not have the answers to that, but, uh, but definitely it's something that we're very focused on, how our community engagement is actually quite exclusive, even when we try to do as much inclusion uh, as we want to, we kind of know who's going to show up and, and who's going to be the loud man with the hydraulic somewhat understanding. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, this last question, uh, we want to focus on a multi-sector approach, which is what this, uh, what this conference is about. So um, just for this last question, let's each take a minute or two to talk about the ways that cloudburst management and or flood resilience in general provides opportunities to walk, work across sectors. And we've already been talking about, I mean, we have two city agencies on the panel, but um, just any specific examples you want to mention? Melissa, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so the New York City Cloudburst program wouldn't be a program without um, multiple actors. So we have our public partner, public agency partners um, who are essential to getting the work implemented and that includes our Department of Transportation um, and our Department of um, Parks and Recreation as well. And so these other landowners and operators of our public spaces are critical. Um, but also private property has a huge role to play in this as well. We launched um, a private incentive program we call Resilient NYC Partners. 
a few years ago to help tee up some of this work and we're managing um, cloudburst events on um, private property as well and working with landowners who have a lot of impervious surfaces and getting them to re-envision the way that their properties can be used and the way stormwater can be managed there. Um, and we're also through these flooding town halls that I mentioned working with um, you know smaller property owners and homeowners and engaging them on things and activities they can take to protect themselves from flooding, but also participating in these larger conversations, you know, cleaning catch basins, keeping them free of debris and litter um, before a storm event, chipping in and helping the city with rain garden maintenance. You know, it takes a village to, to address this type of flooding and everybody has a role to play. So it's been really important for us. How about you, Erin? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I love that. It does take a village. Um, we work very closely with DEP, DOT, Con Ed, um, private property owners, particularly for our regional railroads. Um, you know, one specific example that I think has continued over the years, um, we had a great task force that came out of IDA, um, and it was DEP, DOT, MTA, um, others. And we've been able to continue that work, um, you know, in, in smaller groups. Um, you know, we meet regularly. And, uh, you know, Melissa, you mentioned the stormwater plan that came out today looking at um, areas of the city where DEP is going to prioritize stormwater infrastructure. And so that's a great example of something that our team can look at and compare that to where we're seeing impacts in our stations or impacts across our infrastructure due to cloud bursts and really align those capital priorities, align our priorities so that all of our infrastructure is working as best as it can for, for our community. So look forward to, to looking at that and, and continuing the work. Any last words, Trina? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, part of being, I know there are many from global consultancies here, but I think part of that is the, actually the, the luxury of getting to work in very different geographies. Mm -hmm. We have projects in Borneo, in New York City. We worked with DEP in 2017 on, on sort of saying how could this look, this Copenhagen approach look in, in New York City. Uh, I think uh, we, last week we launched an MOU with Brooklyn College to um, connect Copenhagen and New York City even closer on this sort of curious approach to, to resilience in general, but uh, particularly uh, water driven. Um, but I think even though I'm, I'm constantly saying complexity, you know, you need complex solutions when you're uh, addressing something that is complex and Cloudburst needs to be place specific and place inspired. Uh, it's also to say that many of the challenges we sit and, and address in one geography versus the other is actually also somewhat universal. Uh, the challenges manifest somewhat in a similar style. Uh, cities are organized sort of similar. Uh, maintenance is never a fun mm -hmm. conversation, neither is parking. So you have all these different uh, conversations and you're like, oh, I sat and had that one in a different geography at a different mm -hmm. time. So I think there's so much that cities, municipalities, consultancies, I think we're all in this together. So I think by connecting not only locally, but as actually also globally. I know that for Copenhagen and New York, New York City had worked more on the coastal side than Copenhagen, so there were some exchanges there and vice versa on Cloudburst where Copenhagen had worked on that. And I think these connections is very much what we're also trying to foster uh, with working in so many different geographies. Uh, and I see a huge benefit and a huge potential there. So my answer to this question is, uh, is well, there's a lot of them, but um, my, the one thing I think about all the time from especially the projects that I've worked on in recent years is, is stakeholder engagement. And most of the people in this room, I don't have to beat this drum, but you know, early and often, um, there's been a few projects where we're, we've just been facing um, complexities and challenges and hardships towards the end because we weren't able to coalesce um, the stakeholders and property owners around um, the ideas in the beginning. And, um, you know, writing proposals recently, and, and the Cloudburst proposal included this, where we're, um, where, uh, you know, getting u u letters out to the utilities and, this, and the other agencies, the partner agencies in the very beginning, um, just to get on paper that we've, that we've let them know. And, and, and I think Cloudburst, everyone's excited and, and, and ready to go. But, um, 
you know, from, from other agencies to utilities to property owners to the community, I think it's a, it's a big lift, but doing it in the beginning um, and, and, and making sure everyone feels that they have, that they're engaged and they're involved, but they also have a responsibility uh, has been, has been, and it's actually gonna happen. These projects are actually gonna happen, so they actually have to start thinking about how it's gonna impact, you know, existing conditions, proposed conditions in their community is, is really important. Um, so I don't wanna, uh, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, so uh, we need a show of hands. It'll be uh, A or B, true or false, um, or A or B, sorry, I did A or B. So these are our three PDH questions. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to, it's pretty fun, right? <laughs> so they're pretty, they're easy. So do we um, have to answer too? Yeah. Oh, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> you, if you, if you guys don't know the answer, we're in trouble. Um, so a cloudburst is designed, it def, is defined as A, an intense, an, I can't speak today, an intense short duration rainfall event, or B, a surge of coastal waters flow, flowing inland. So how many say A? How many say B? Good job, <laughs> all right, nice. Um, so New York City DEP is modifying, oh, we didn't talk about this, so oh, this is a, this is a, <laughs> is modifying standard details and measures to support efficiencies in Cloudburst designed and provide for multiple benefits. So this will be interesting. Do you think these standard details are based on A, combined sewer overflow measures, or B, green infrastructure measures? Who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? B. Yeah, you, Melissa mentioned that a little bit. So one of the things that um, we're doing as part of the Cloudburst um, program is we're taking the already approved and, and um, tested green infrastructure measures uh, or green infrastructure standard details and we're um, modifying them and working across um, projects with other consultants to determine what we think will be the best um, Cloudburst measures that combined both the water quality and the, the stormwater management. Okay, and final question. Upskilling can be an important part of the successful operation of Cloudburst infrastructure. During today's panel, upskilling was defined as A, teaching community members to take on the maintenance of non-hydraulic functions of stormwater infrastructure, or B, <laughs> increasing the size of the pipes through which stormwater flows. Did you, did you cheat and I wasn't looking? <laughs> um, so is it A or B? All right, you guys all passed the test. Great. <laughs> Good job. Um, so we do have a few minutes for questions. I think there's someone from Waterfront Alliance with a, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, so like you all kind of talked about the adaptation me measures for cloud bus. I wanted to ask like about the mitigation. Uh, are different organizations doing anything for mitigation as well or is just like looking for future? I'm having a hard time hearing you, sorry. I was asking like, uh, you're all talking about adaptation measures for cloud bus. I wanted to ask what about the mitigation measures? Are uh, like, can we avoid cloud bust at all, if possible, or is just like uh, dealing with it after it happens? Did you say remediation? I'm, can you? Mitigation. Yeah. Mitigation. Yeah, mitigation. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm like, did you guys want to take it? Um, yeah, I I can answer part of that. I think so. For New York City, we we did a year and a half long planning effort to determine if cloud burst infrastructure, as the way we were defining it would even have a benefit on, on street flooding in, in particular. And so we did identify, um, we went through a pretty technical um, feasibility analysis to determine, you know, to define what is um, success. And part of that success for us was reducing deep and contiguous flooding that occurs on the city streets in a future 10 year storm. So pretty specific, but we needed that advanced kind of goal to understand if the solutions we were proposing would even have a mitigation impact. And so um, having that goal set before we um, have started design was really important for us to identify where we would be effective because there are parts of the city where this type of solution would not have an impact on flooding. And so we wanted to, to make sure, you know, we were spending our money and time wisely for that. And that can be hard for community members to 
accept or agree with or but you know that's part of our job too is that and that educational perspective is letting them letting them know that this project is for this there's other projects that are for other things so um, it's an important part of, of Cloudburst but you can say that uh, to avoid more extreme rain or more rain in general for a city like New York City, you need to also work on your emissions, right? Or that's actually global concentration yeah, of emissions. Uh, and even if today we cut it to almost nothing, you'll still see this yeah. lag in the development. Uh, so it is just what is the reality of, of many cities, but all cities are also working on reducing emissions from you know, transport from buildings, from whatever. It's multi-sector from yeah. that perspective yes. too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Another question? Hi, uh, first time caller, long time fan of the Cloudburst program. <laughs> <laughs> Deeply uh, involved for many years in the uh, Harbor and Tributary Study, which got its start as a storm surge program and now is supposed to be multi-sector and multi-hazard. And so, those in the audience might be interested to know how you're dovetailing your work with the work of the two states, the work of the Army Corps, and how to make sure that we're not just solving for Sandy, but also solving for the next Ida as well. Aaron, do you, does anyone, no? Do you wanna take that? You want me to take it? <laughs> Well, I mean, I can say, you know, our, our New York City Cloudburst program really is focused on inland flooding, yeah. um, and that's, that's what we set off, you know, to do, because we have been working um, on our coastal protection projects, and you're, you're seeing some today, um, but for inland flooding, it was a risk we didn't really understand until we published our inland stormwater flooding maps in 2019. And once those maps came out, then Ida happened five months later, and we were forced in a good way to start dedicating real capital towards inland flooding solutions. That doesn't mean this whole other world is happening that Lorian just talked about and amazing things happening at the agency, and we work closely together too. And so, you know, finding the resources to balance both has been, um, you know, a challenge, uh, but it's also a very exciting time. I'll say I think it's all connected, right? Um, I mean, you could just use an example of, of the, the hub that um, AECOM's working on, Casina Park. And, you know, the, it takes 20% of, of the drainage area of Queens through the trunk sewer mains that go out to Flushing Bay. Well, Flushing Bay is a tidal, tidally influenced water body, right? So you have a storm that is Sandy and Irene combined and you've got a storm surge and then you have the rainfall and anything I think we can do to mitigate for, um, for f whether it's pluvial or, or you know, coastal flooding, storm surge flooding, is going to be a benefit because you never know what kind of storm you're gonna get. You never know, I mean, if you get it at a high tide and the, you know, the tide gates are all um, covered with the, you know, with the whether it's the surge or just the actual tide itself, it impacts inland flooding. So I think it's all very connected. Um, you know, you're looking at it from a capital perspective as an inland flooding or a coastal flooding project, but depending on what kind of storm we get, I mean, God forbid we get a Sandy and Irene combined storm, but it's, um, it's important from that perspective. And maybe also many cities are looking to see what is the combined probability. And yeah. I mean, yeah. researchers yeah. in the room will know how difficult that yeah. really is to understand what is that combined probability. Because yeah. you can't do an integrated risk assessment of both of those happening if you don't know the actual probability, then you're just overlaying two massive risks and it's exaggerated. Uh, but you need the hydraulic modeling need to be integrated across both. Otherwise, you're not doing a one water, as Lauren said. You're doing this water and then this water knowing obviously that that's not how water works. And, and most coastal projects, it's, it's necessary to do an interior drainage study anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's complicated, but, yeah. but all interconnected. I think, are we at, do we have one more? Time for one more, David? If it's quick. Okay, if it's quick. Hi, I'm Aditi. I just graduated last week from Pratt, so the answer to my question could be in a utopian world, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> so uh, you touched a little bit uh, on like private properties and private owners. So I just want to understand like uh, is 
do you have any like uh, strategies or any sort of like ideas on what could be inculcated in a sort of a new development because as all the pilots show cloud burst planning goes beyond your particular site it also goes to the streets and the surrounding areas so how do you encourage these private developers with all the money kind of to sort of inculcate these good uh, design principles so if you have any so I would say the unified storm water rule and then your toolkit, right? Yeah, uh, so we implemented a unified storm water rule in New York City back in 2022. We're two years into implementation. It requires significant on-site storm water management for every property in New York City that redevelops. But if you're a larger property, 20,000 square feet or more, it requires the use of green infrastructure. So some sort of on-site retention in addition to detention. And it's, it's a lot, I'll say. There, we have a hierarchy and a design manual that goes through all the requirements to meet the regulations, but also prioritizes vegetated practices for the city, which is giving us a better look and feel for our neighborhoods and also helping with other hazards like heat. So um, on-site uh, stormwater management for redevelopment is really important to us here, and these new regulations I'm really glad we implemented them when we did because now it's just another piece of the puzzle pulling it all together. And it's it's not just a if you want to or it's you it's a it's a requirement. It's codified mm -hmm. and and not a lot of cities go through this extent of of codifying the green first approach, but we have, and we're proving that you can do it here in, in New York City, and that's what we want. So I wish we had more time for questions. We'll be, we'll be down here if you want to talk to any of us or, or find us for the rest of the program. But I just wanted to thank my, my panel. <laughs> this is so exciting. I'm already, uh, I'm already pushing for a Cloudburst 2.0 session next year. So stay tuned and uh, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Thanks, guys. Thank you.